Hi, folks. Welcome to Sunday's edition of the iWrite Radio podcast uh, and video cast. Keep forgetting the video. Um, we've got Stuart with me today. Jimmy is out trying to earn a living. Um, Sunday, well, I suppose we have to mention Mar and Brewer in Scotland. Uh, we'll have a quick chat about that. But there's three articles have popped up today. Um, Ian McQuarter in the Sunday Herald. And I've already forgotten the other two. <laughs> Neil Mackay uh, talks to Andrew Wilson, who he describe, describes as the brains behind Indy. Sorry. <laughs> the National and Jerry Hassan has written a, quite a long read. Yeah. Um, well, well, to kick off with Mar, you didn't catch Mar this morning. It was exactly what you would expect it to be. It was a quick look at the papers. Um, apparently, Matt Hancock had a pint after hours in a bar at Parliament at Westminster. Um, and I think it's the males making an issue of that. Another Tory scandal. Uh, um, but he, they really went on the Manchester fight with Westminster. Um, Andy Burnham has got quite a lot of support from other conservative MPs in his area, but some out with the area who have got lower figures have written a letter telling him to sit down and do as he's tell by the government. So that, that was a bit of a spat. Um, Rachel Reeves came on for the Labour Party yakking about um, the two-week circuit break that might be three weeks or it might be 28 days, which when I went to school was four weeks. So there seems some doubt about this, the sort of hard parameters of the, the Labour Party policy on this. Um, and finished off with Michael Gove. Michael Gove is impressive. You can show Michael Gove a video, which Mar did, of him stating that no deal Brexit would be the worst thing that could possibly happen. Mm -hmm. And he manages to tell people without blinking that that's not actually what he said or thought. But that is, is it, uh, that is his strength. He, and I mean, he, he's a bare faced liar. But he also does it. He also delivers it. He is also the guy in the specs at the back of the class. He's not the threatening bully. So there's, well, a, there's a lot of people, remember how well Morris, how, how successful Morris he was with the Smiths. You know, there are all those people that think Gove's okay because he's like me. Well, I mean, he just sat there and lied. Kept talking, did that usual tactic of making the answer 14 times as long as it needs to be. That's but, padding, fills the time slot, doesn't it? Yeah, cuts down on the questions, mm. does all that. Mar tried valiantly, but uh, well, that's an exaggeration. Mar tried is. valiantly for Mar, uh, um, but go. I mean, the bare face, brass neck of the man is it's unimpeachable. I mean, he could murder children in front of the camera and deny it happened. Well, we know that that earlier this week. Oh, astonishing! If, earlier this week, the issue was him talk was the defending food standards in the UK. And then he, there he was, they were playing a clip, not even from a political program, it was from Country File, where he, def he, <laughs> where he was saying, no, I'll defend your food standards in the UK for farmers. And we know he hasn't. But this is Douglas Ross. Douglas Ross is doing the same thing. I, you know, we've promised we will not lower food standards. You know, you can trust the... No, we can't. We can't trust a single word well, look, uh, Boris Johnson's government says. See, you, I'm sorry, we're in, I, I keep telling people, and I keep telling you as well, just lower that tone of your voice. You sound exasperated. You, I'm no longer exasperated. I know these people are liars. They have actually practiced the art of liar and lying and pushed it, like gangsters do. Look, let me explain something. This is a, How does a gangster work? A gangster works by threatening you, now, if you do what you're told, you don't get battered. If you don't do what you're told, you do get battered. But if you do what you're told, 
you're probably going to have to steal something from the corner shop for the big bully. And if you do it once, you'll have, you'll have to do it again because you become a slave. And that's how the, what, they've already played that trick, Cummings and Gove and, and, and Johnson. Johnson doesn't think this way, but Cummings and Gove have. So that they lie and they've got away with lying and they've got away with Cummings driving to Barnard Castle to test his eyesight. They've got away with all this. So now they carry on. They know that they can lie with impunity. Well, I, I'm just, how any journalist interviewing Gov lets me away with it, I don't know. But, they are gangsters. But he is very, very able at just basically bare-faced lies and talking on and on and on and doing all, using all the tricks, spinning everything totally. I mean, can you imagine being in a negotiation with these people? You couldn't believe a word they said. Well, we already know that. I'm sorry, I'm repeating you know. myself. Well, yes. But the I suppose it's an excuse for me to mention Paul Kavanagh, we ginger dog, who oh, really? had a piece in the national just saying that he'd had quite a severe stroke. His I think it's his left hand side has been affected. Um so he's going to have to learn to write with his right hand, he reckons. But he, uh, <laughs> he he's calling his left leg Gove because it's useless. I would suggest he shouldn't quite start calling it Michael Gove until it goes gangrenous and is actually poisonous to the whole system. But there you go. I'm so not quite it, sure how to react to that, Nori, because it's, I well, didn't realise how bad it was for him. Well, but, it's early days, so hopefully he... I mean, he, he's hopeful that he'll get um, use back, uh, but who knows? Unfortunately, nobody knows. No, nobody um, knows. So we wish him well. Mm -hmm. We certainly uh, do. Hopefully, uh, we'll have his input in the near future um, and get well soon, Mr. Kavanagh. I think we should move on to. Uh, Can I mention? Scottish, uh, sorry, Gordon Brewer. I was just about to say, I think we should move on to the Scottish Mar. Look, I, I watched the whole bit. I sat down there with a full full step size notepad. I wrote notes, copious notes on both sides just to, to get my, this is how I remember things as you get older. Well, I did so when I was at university as well, but it helped. And I read it all before I'd even got to the end of two, I actually wrote down two sides of full scrap paper and I got to the end of it and I thought, they have said absolutely nothing. I've gone to all this effort to write all this stuff down in case there was, there was something that was any relevance and there was absolutely nothing in it. Do you know, the only thing that was relevant was really odd was that we had Ian Blackford. God, I was going like this before he even came on. And he comes on and he says, and he says nothing, absolutely nothing. And Gordon Brewer didn't even rip him apart and, and, and he could have so easily because Ian Blackford said nothing so then after Ian Blackford said nothing along comes Andrew Bowie and Andrew Barry last week got ripped apart on Twitter for something silly but that's another issue leave that aside so Andrew Bowie I couldn't believe what he said he agreed entirely with he said oh I agree entirely with what Ian Blackford said he never said a controversial word and that's what was really interesting about today's uh, uh, well, Miller show I, I think what we have to take out of that uh, there's, there's two conclusions one is that they're going to leave all the dirty fighting to Dross, to Douglas Ross He's, they're going to leave him to be the one that attacks Sturgeon and the Scottish government that's one way it might be going the other way is they've decided they've seen figures. They know something's working, so they don't want to criticize the Scottish government um, because it might be working. And if it is, they have to find a way to turn that round to it was our idea anyway. I'm going to claim what I, what I was up to three months ago, four months ago, which was the Scottish Tories kept attacking the SNP in a way that, that just it just improved 
the poll results for yes. Like fired, yeah. And I kept saying that every time they fired something else out. And I think maybe they've realized that, which is a little unfortunate from the yes movement's point of view, if they've actually realized how damaging it is for the, what the, their entire policy has been wrong. Well, it, it was very placid politics on Brewer, very placid. Um, and I, I think, as, as I said, when we were discussing what we were going to discuss today, <laughs> I think that the only really important thing is to say that Brewer's one of a whole host of people, Isabel Fraser is amongst them, yeah. who are retiring from the BBC, yeah, taking their pensions and running. Kenny McDonald. Now, he's a guy I would have done a lot of time for. Science well, and education. Is, Isabel Fraser is another one. Rebel Alderson, who did the, the courts. Yep, yep. Um, oh, no, it's, um, it's probably very... Un I, it doesn't look like a... Well, what are they going to be replaced by? Think about it. Well, there, there's some very good Scottish talent, but it's not in Scotland. It's yeah, but, in Sooth. Yeah, but think about it this way. Just think about it generally. You get promoted to get on telly or on radio where people notice you on radio, on BBC Scotland, right? Pacific Key, whatever comes out of Pacific Key. You're a new face, a new voice. And you've just been promoted. Are you going to upset your boss by saying anything controversial? No, but I mean, that, just to harp back a second, uh, the BBC are going to cap redundancy next year or the year after. And that is the reason these guys are going now, while they can get the, the best redundancy package possible. Um, they're calling it early retirement, but it is redundancy. I'm sure they do very well in pensions at the BBC. I'm not going to say anymore. Well, they... My cousin used to be, she worked for the BBC for a very long time. Let's put it this way. I went to see Auntie Cathy's show at Queen Margaret Drive when I was about six years old, which was a, a kid's show on radio, courtesy of my cousin who worked there. And she worked there until she retired, so... Well, um, that, that is no doubt one of the reasons that they're cutting the package because they feel it's too generous. Anyway, um, let's, let's move on to the Deadwood Press. Let's move on to uh, the papers today. Yes. Um, where will we start? Well, can I start with a, a little bit of optimism before I get my venom into Andrew Wilson? I want to talk about Jerry Hassan. Jerry, I like Jerry. We've been reading Jerry, what Jerry writes ever since Twitter was invented. We've been followed each other on Twitter ever since it started. Uh, the other week I did, it was badly composed. Effectively, the way I look, I'm going to, I'm going to sum up what I see as Jerry, and, and this is, I think it's a reasonable point of view to, to broadcast, is that Jerry Hassan longs for a, a kind of Scottish Labour Party that doesn't exist. And he cannot quite go for full independence. What he wants is a kind of devolution of these islands. But he doesn't, he can't quite cross that river to realize that look, what he wants, if he wants to get what he wants, he's going to have to start with an independent Scotland, not run by the Labour Party. And then you might have a Nordic kind of organization for these islands that might work but he just can't cross that river for some reason or other i i don't i don't disagree entirely i just recently i felt that jerry was had kind of he put one leg on the side of the fence with the sign that said independence he seemed to be a little bit more strident but he spends so much of his time insisting that independence should look like his watered down socialist Labour Party vision that I think it would be more honest of him if he said independence only if the Labour Party's in charge. That's kind of, yes, that's part of what I would agree with. But to me, he jumps straight from 
I, I can see the argument saying that even an in independent Scotland, given we live on these islands with England next door, and you're sleeping with an elephant, the rest of the Celtic nations, whatever we can, it doesn't matter what um, international status we have, we're going to have to live with England being this elephant in the bed. But you just can't make that jump to realize that the, the, the better relationships we can all, us minor partners can have is being independent and not being smothered by the bed, the bed, by the, the elephant in the bed. I think, yeah, well, I mean, that's fair enough. I mean, England will always be there. But if we're part of the EU, we're part of an even bigger elephant that England has to consider rolling over. I'm not 100% sure that the EU is the place to go at the moment. I'd certainly be hedging my bets if you asked me uh, in the run up to an independence referendum. I'd probably say EEA at the moment. I I'm, think what, I'm, I'm floating between those two stools myself at the moment. I mean, it, it, certainly, I mean, it, it, the longer you <laughs> think about it this way, the longer you resist the advances by the EU for Scot an a newly independent Scotland to join, the more you'll get out of them. As soon as you're in yes, there, once you're yeah. in there, once you're in there on the deal you get, then that's it. But if yeah. you haven't, you're not yet in there, and they want you in there because of the the seas, the energy, the tides, the wind. Um, then you've got a different deal. Well, that's just my thought on that. Shall I tip, shall I summarize? I think it was, it's worthwhile mentioning one or two things in Jerry's article, not just talking about Jerry. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, he talks about it. I liked his headline. I think it was a very interesting headline because the headline of his article is Scottish independence, independence as an idea won the 2014 referendum. And I'd have to agree with that. I think it did because although we lost the referendum, the idea of independence suddenly became far more popular. So yeah, it, was worth, yeah. it was worthwhile having the referendum and that alone. He goes through a whole number of points about why things are, I, I, the words descriptive and prescriptive are, I think he got muddled with the article. He was being descriptive about, about things that existed and being prescriptive in the same list. So you ended up, ended, I ended up a bit muddled. What are you going on about? You should have cleared. I'm becoming a bit of an analyst of other people's, people's writing and I really don't deserve to do so because my writing's appalling. But let me just go through one or two points here. First, he says here, what's driving independence? Well, 64% of all voters think Scotland and England are moving in different directions. We are actually moving apart, and the, vote, and the polls say so. Second, Boris is toxic in Scotland. You know, he's awful. Third, independence cannot... And this is where he moves from descriptive straight into prescriptive. Independence cannot become identified with the inadequacies of present, Scot present day Scotland. Okay, fair enough. That's <laughs> now let's go back into descriptive. Uh, no, he's, stuck in, he's still stuck in prescriptive. The detail of independence matters. So does the wider philosophy. Um, we have to embrace growing up. So that's in prescriptive. Um, descriptive independence involves a psychological dimension about risk and you know, a risk. The risk factor has totally changed. Back in 2014, the big risk was to go independent. Now, look at the state of the UK. It's a, it's a, it's, it, it starts to become a bigger risk to stay, doesn't it? Well, I, you know, do you want to win the referendum, Jerry? Ah, well, there's another question. <laughs> you know. Here. Because if you want to win the, the referendum, you look at what the Brexiteers did. No, he's still stuck and you with don't Gordon talk, Brown. And you don't talk about risk. You talk about sunny uplands. You know, if, if Brexit has taught us anything, it's just ignore the downside. And, and here I'm talking about fighting a, a, a referendum. I'm not talking about the reality being risk-free. But if, if you're going to have a campaign that talks about risk, you're asking to lose. 
And if, it, if risk becomes a big topic, you talk about the risk of staying. You don't talk about the risk of exactly. leaving. Exactly. And that, I mean, he does mention that. That's the flip side now. You, you look at the union and you say, right, isn't that riskier than independence? And, I, and you could argue that's why we've got <laughs> other, you know, there's an argument, oh, Nicola Sturgeon, hasn't she done well? Well, she has done well. But also there, there's, the, the, there's the driving force of looking at what's happening south of the border. And generally speaking, I, there, there is little dispute that Scottish people, generally speaking, vote left of centre, not not right of centre. They have done all my life, apart you know, apart from when I was a bairn. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think that's true. I, th I think that and I would be interested to see how Jerry wrote if Richard Leonard, Leonard came out tomorrow and said the Labour Party will support an independence referendum. <laughs> I, I think we would see different words on the paper from well, Jerry. Let me point out that uh, today's press includes uh, articles that saying that yes, do you see how the annual conference in about a month's time? And apparently they are expected to support a second independence referendum. They were they are, they cannot necessarily support a yes, but they will yeah. certainly support a second independence. That will be their policy at the, at the upcoming conference. Now that's new. Yeah, that this was talked about last week, wasn't it? Um, and this is this is to do with the internal market bill and the um, the loss of power for the devolved governments. I think that the trade union movement in general prefers to deal with devolved governments rather than Westminster for obvious reasons. I mean, they're both well. The SNP is centre, if not left of centre, and obviously in Wales, it's the Labour Party in charge. Um, they would, I would imagine, would rather speak to. And the, I think it would be fair to say the SNP have had the door open to the unions fairly consist consistently. So they, I think they maybe think they've got a little bit more leverage with the SNP. Who knows? Who knows? So uh, Jerry moves on to the defence by the unionists in, an, in the next referendum, and he talks about something called transactional nationalism, and I've yet to look that up. I should have done. It sounds like something I should know all about, transactional nationalism. That's all about, with the devolution, We've got the Barnet form formula and the fiscal transfers across the UK. Now, they're a long way away from being a clear reason to vote one way or the other anymore. There was a time when, even up to last week, week or la two weeks ago, you had these Tory MPs in Scotland saying, look at the £700 million we gave you and the £7 billion we gave you. And as soon as they say that these days, somebody else fires up. Yeah, but we paid twice as much in taxes. So it, it, that I, argument is, it, it's fading. The power of it is fading. I, I am almost certain that this um, internal market bill will allow the Westminster government to spend Barnet consequentials on behalf of Scotland in Scotland on whatever projects they decide. The STUC, uh, the bit I read about the STUC coming up with a expected policy includes referring to that. Well, Michael Gove has specifically said uh, in front of the Holyrood committee that that will not happen. So, <laughs> I, so, well, I, it will. so I am almost certain it will happen. I'm almost certain it will. So let me just summarize, summarize what this transactional nationalism looks like, according to Jerry. So with it, talk about things like fiscal transfers and think about it these days. Um, the unionists like to use it as a defense of the union. It, so they talk about transfers from London and the, east, the, and the southeast to Scotland. The only thing is it's become more and more apparent that the other parts of England depend on these transfers far more than Scotland does. Yeah, well, at the moment, I think we're the third most wealthy area. Uh, exactly. After London, and then the South East. East. Scotland yeah. is the wealthiest part of the UK. That's according to their figures, let alone international. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and that is going to be interesting 
if what we're hearing about the fiscal transfer from London to um, Berlin and Paris is accurate, I just wonder how long London will head that particular statistical pyramid. There seems to be an awful lot of money moving to Europe, Dublin. Oh, well, that's not a fiscal transfer. I was thinking of the, the never mind. Well, I mean, can I move on to the second point? Is that the, but don't forget the, the Barnett formula, don't forget the polls that have they've run about Tory voters and Brexit voters and all the rest of it about um, how do you feel about Scotland going independent? And a lot of them are quite keen on it because they, a lot of right wing Tories, really believe this all this money pours into Scotland. Kevin McKenzie. Kelvin that'll, McKenzie. Kelvin McKenzie. Yeah, that'll those. be the jocks off the payroll then. Good. Yes, and, and as someone else said somewhere, you know, if you said that about blacks, you, the police would be around arresting you. But you, you can say that about Scotland. Not for too much longer, I hope. And what was the third finger? Oh, yes. Some, it's a bit more... Oh, I can't think of the right word. Well, let me describe it rather than come up with a word to describe it, which is that um, if the figure of a typical transfer to Scotland is nearly £2,000 per head, compared to what the average English person gets. What about the money that goes back with the harm that, that having to, that London right, makes sir. all these decisions for us is costing us money as well? Well, the, 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 pro, the problem coming down the track is that this government at Westminster is going to make no allowances. They can't make allowances in Scotland because they're going to do damage that is similar in England. So the damage has to be countrywide. So they're going to get less popular. That nothing I can see nothing on the horizon that would help the unionist cause at all. Nothing. Unless by some miracle the Labour Party has a huge surge south of the border. That would be the biggest threat to the independence numbers at the moment. Not right, the Tory so, party, not the unionists, if Labour has a surge south of the border. So then, then uh, Jerry goes into the whole Labour party, Scottish Labour party policy about, you know, we're, we, we don't trust the SNP and da, da, da. And, and, well, not, not, I'm in the SNP and I don't trust the SNP either. I want to challenge them. But he goes into this as a reason and I, 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 to worry about. I said, well, I look, there are people who do worry about it. But I'm, 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 say, I'm sorry. Is he trying to say that there is another party in Scotland that is more trustworthy? No, no that's a very good point. Because I don't trust Labour. I don't think Labour have the talent to govern. Well, they've, unfortunately, the, the talent and the careerists have moved into the SNP, but that's a totally different topic. Well, I, I, I obviously don't think the Tories are capable, but I can't see the Labour Party suddenly sprouting capable people to run the country. I mean, is there? Can you imagine anybody <laughs> in the Labour Party sitting in Holyrood at the moment? Look, God, look! All the talent in the Labour Party and all the ambitious people in the Labour Party left ten years ago, yeah. two thousand and two thousand and seven, when the SNP first came, went into power in, in, in Holyrood, and you and I, on the seventh of May two thousand and seven, we held our first. Grumpy old men broadcast on Leith FM, and we discussed this bloody issue then, 13 years ago. Wow. I'm getting tired of talking about the Labour Party. Let's move let on me to something no, let me, I've got one thing to sum up, that's all, and we can move on. Because we've missed one thing he wanted to talk about, which was finally is the challenge to institutional Scotland. He's talking about the media, the big issue of the broadcasters, BBC, ITV and Sky. The former is in particular follows behind the curve of this debate, seems incredulous of the Scotland it sees before it and scared to take risks portraying and represent, representing it. Um, and I mean, I don't really like the way he, le he leaves the media to the very last thing because the media is second on the list of the most important barrier to us getting independence legally, safely, 
without violence and respect but, in the world. But if you're looking for change, it's a total waste of time having a paragraph on the media anyway. There is no way that the media are going to change direction. Well, the biggest danger of It's not going to happen. The biggest danger of violence in the breakup of the United Kingdom is the media, not the people. Yes, but at some point that will there'll be some committee sitting in a dark room in a basement in Westminster gaming this. And if they see an advantage in encouraging riots in the streets, they'll take it. They will take it. And I and really, if if we get another referendum and the, the polls are sitting at five fifty-five percent in favor of independence. Do you think there's anything that the British government will not try <laughs> or great. sanction? Oh, well, we know that. And then we've got, I mean, you've got to we run through the list of things that would be preposterous not to be true. One, the SNP will, be in, or will, will have been infiltrated by the British security services 20, 30 years ago, and they'll still be there. Yeah. The civil service in London we, in Whitehall will be up because they've already done so during the last NDRF. They even gave them medals for, for helping win the no side. Stuart, we've spent 20 minutes on Jerry Hassan. Let's move on. Yeah, let's. <laughs> uh, Ian McQuarter. Ian, I'm not sure. I can't remember what the, who had said. I think the one that really upset me was that. Um, Andrew Wilson, but Ian McQuarter, let's take back control, said the Brexiters. He's kidding. Ian's, Ian's just filling his number, you know, he's he's the guy that said um, today's article, he says, finally the jocks will be off the payroll, announced Kelvin McKenzie. Yeah. He was the one that used that today. Um, I think Ian just really sums up what is already going on, what we already know. I don't find anything to get angry about. What do you feel about that? Well, I, I'm, this brings me back to the will the media change thing. Again, I thought McQuarter was beginning to look like he'd actually put his foot down on the independent side of the fence. I think he's back to sitting on the fence here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and that, that's kind of how I, I gauge articles now. I'm I'm looking for that shift that Jerry Hassan talked is talking about in his article, um, and it's towing towing the water stuff and then out the war because it's still a bit chilly, um, which is really where I saw McQuarter's piece, his um, blood and soil argument. I think is in there, is it not? The unionists. Um, I think I noticed a change in Ian McWhorter when Paul Hutchin left. Where did he go? The record. Yeah, he's he's he went to the record. More the money record. in the record, big, much bigger uh, readership. Uh, and I don't recall the Herald um, employing anybody else to replace Paul Hutchin as a political editor. I think they just added that title to Ian McWhorter's name and probably offered him another three or four grand a year. Well, he's, he doesn't write like a political editor. He, I mean, I quite like Ian. He, he, he does come up with some original thoughts. I quite like reading his stuff. But he's still doing this tightrope walk. He hasn't made his mind up, which is a legitimate position, you know, but makes him a devolutionist rather than a a, a unionist or a, a yeser. Um, I I have just I, I dispute one or two things he says in the article. Um, there can be no prospect of an independence referendum during a pandemic, say Labour and Tories. And once it's over, Scots will realise it's a non-starter because, ha ha, we'll be out of the EU and that means leaving the UK is a much harder nut to crack. Yeah, but read what he goes on to say. He, he makes that point as a third person. 
and then goes on to say, but it's not really true. He's, as a, he, he's fence sitting right through the article, which is legitimate. I mean, he is reporting what the two sides are saying. Um, it's not taking us any further forward. I think you're right. It, it's a kind of laying out the arguments of the two sides. He says, uh, he does, he is descriptive. He says, voting yes in future will mean creating a hard border with England. This is referring to the fact that England's not, no longer, well, we're no longer in the EU. Um, and very difficult choices about currency and debt. Well, I'm not going to dis disagree with that part. That is, the, that should be the second topic discussed at the SNP conference at the end of uh, November, but goodness knows what they'll be talking about by the time we get there. I I just, I mean, it's, it's one of my problems with him. He presumes there will be debt. As of there, there you go. And the question of currency, I mean... And, I, under the I, rules of international I'm, law, England is responsible for any debt from the UK I, I, the if they wish to keep their international treaties. I'm with uh, I'm with quite a few other people on, on the question of currency. The point is, if if you are not in control of your currency, you're not independent. We know that, but you cannot have a Scottish pound the day we become independent. There has to be a run up to it. Uh, uh, well, let's not talk about theoretical ones. Let's look at how quickly some other countries in Europe replaced their currency say that it was the ruble, for example, which obviously would be a hard one to replace, wouldn't it, eh? given the threats you would get if you're going to replace the, the ruble? I mean, there'll be games played. There'll be a, a Scottish pound created that is linked to sterling. You know, I mean, we'll have our own currency when it's politically necessary. Yeah, but... but rather Andrew, than when Andrew it's Wilson. economically necessary. But Andrew Wilson is suggesting we've got 25 years be, uh, and he's implying almost in that we'd be stuck with the pound for 25 years. We'd go down with England economically if we were I, stuck with it. I'm not actually sure why people give Andrew Wilson so much credence. Well, not I really that. don't. I mean, the economics of the world are, are changing. It might well be the case that three years from now, Andrew Wilson is completely right. But right now, he's not completely right. And in 18 months, he'll not be completely right for different reasons. I mean, the, the changes that are going to happen over the next pro probably two years, maybe five, because of coronavirus, because of different ways we're going to work. Brexit. Brexit, technology that's going to kick in that normally would have taken a much longer period. Um, all these things are going to change the economic landscape. And nobody who produced something two years ago is going to be right. Mm. Well, look, uh, uh, one or two points that uh, Ian McWhorter says, I do agree with him. During COVID, Scots realised just how much devolution has changed the equation of governance. Life and death decisions are now taken in Holyrood. Sturgeon has played a blinder. Um, recently, she's been advance, in advance of the UK government in imposing lockdown. Well, I'm not going to go into the details of that. That's really not the point. But he sums up, the border with England is no longer seen as some relic of a na nativist past. I never make up, can't make up my mind what that means. Basically, borders keep you safe or safer. In this sense, Brexit has done the nationalists' job for them. Take back control, they said. We need to make our own laws. Increasingly, Scots are saying aye. Yeah, and I would like to point out his, uh, his unionist bias by not pointing out that decisions are limited for the Scottish government because they cannot borrow money to recompense businesses they ask to close. Uh, and this is a, a, an omission. And why can't they borrow money? Because we're because we need permission from Westminster. We have less powers to borrow money than an English county. Do you know that? Well, the point I'm making here is this is a, an omission that is common to just about every single article from every single side that discusses what the Scottish government should do differently or has done differently. The Commonweal produced an article the other day with no mention of money. 
And the, I mean, the common wheel surely believes people should be supported when they're asked to self-isolate, et cetera. Uh, Craig Dozio had no mention of money in that article. Uh, McQuarter has no mention of the money in the article. If any article about independence uh, that mentions COVID has to mention the fact that the Scottish government's got one hand tied behind its back because it has no revenue ra uh, raising powers out with those that Westminster allows it to have. It's constrained. It has to follow a four nation policy when it comes to lockdown. Well, that's but that kind of re, we, if we rewind back to the Brewer show, and suddenly there was Andrew Bow Bowie, Tory, he's a bit of an attack dog MP, followed Ian Blackford. God, it's like a sheepdog, isn't he? He's like, but, um, every opportunity he had this morning to attack Ian Blackford because Ian Blackford was just wide open and he didn't. No, it would appear there is there is they have definitely got a deal with Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, almost almost certainly because of threats about money made to them. I would imagine, you know, you'll not get this, yeah. and you'll not get that. They keep everybody's keeping stum. They've all agreed not to fall out. Uh, well, I'm not sure they've agreed not to fall out, but I think the Tories, the Scottish Tories especially, uh, seem to have dropped to seven. What was it? Seven billion pounds they were claiming. I think that's going lots to... of which was earmarked specifically. You know why? Why is the Scottish government only paying out forty million? That's forty million out of the Scottish government coffers, not Westminster coffers. Hmm. So it's forty million. So it would be four hundred million if the Westminster government were to do it, added on to what they're doing presently. You know, but. They're spinning, and I think they've. I think some of them have realised. Kate Forbes ripped uh, Dross to pieces over it on question time. But I gather the the Tories re-edited. The, yes, the, they the, edited the, the, edited, the, edited out her answer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's exactly what they did. And on that note, because well, we've, we've run on a bit, shall we have some good news then? Right. Okay. The bookies outside the UK have now put the odds on that Scotland will get its independence in the near future. And that's not 1926, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson, I have too much to talk about to talk about them today. I'll save them for tomorrow. Um, and I hope everybody else has noticed, those of you who are listening on the podcast, behind me it says Trump COVID super spreader event this way. Apparently, uh, some enterprising locals have stuck up some signs near Trump's latest rally. All right. All right. I'm, I'm, I will be interested to see if the First Minister ends up with figures in about a week's time for those that travelled south to watch the Old Farm game. Well, think how tight that margin was. Um, after all, Lancashire went into tier, level tier three, and um, the BBC managed to have a report about some old firm fans in a pub in Carlisle, and the boy was more than happy because it is the busiest day he'd had in six months. But he'd only been in the pub six months, so good. But if you'd gone to Blackpool, there was already reports from Blackpool saying, "Oh." This is terrible, but we're in tier three and we can't, people can't come and da, da, da. Oh. If you go to Blackpool, you could catch the virus and you go back to bloody Dumfries and Galloway and you go back to the Highlands and you'll be, will not be, you'll be upsetting all your pals and relatives if you infect them after being in Blackpool. Just Too late now. An old firm fan. Too late now, job done. Anyway, we'll call it a day at that. Um, I'm sure everybody's ears are bleeding. Um, <laughs> Thanks for listening, folks. Thanks for being with me, Stuart. Um, and we'll catch up with you on Monday. Uh, we'll see you then. Cheers for now, folks.